into this. So um, uh, those of you uh, who are in the room or joining us remotely will recall that yesterday afternoon, we built up a model of a uh, very, very simple model, um, building our skills uh, with nature-based modeling. Um, and, and any logics realization of it, of smoking on the one hand and heart disease, uh, so we characterized uh, stages of uh, heart disease uh, first um, between, um, uh, in a kind of a dichotomous way, between individuals with a healthy heart and uh, those who were, uh, who had developed heart disease. And uh, then we elaborated uh, the model with the representation of smoking status, noting the distinctive structure uh, attendant upon that. Um, and uh, commenting some, some on the the abstractions involved, not breaking out different lengths of time someone has smoked or that they've been quit. Uh, we then link them up to each other through the mechanism of a variable whereby the uh, risk of developing heart disease on a uh, per unit time basis, such as uh, per year basis, depends on smoking status at any one time. And we noted that too was an approximation. Uh, it, uh, it may be that uh, at some point, um, there's an elevated risk of developing heart disease that persists even after quitting smoking if one has been a, a long time smoker, for example. Um, but uh, today we, we, we're going to address a more uh, basic set of issues uh, associated with this. Uh, specifically, um, uh, this model uh, had us starting out in the right direction for, for some basic mechanisms, but we want to add to it uh, some, some elements that capture common needs in agent-based modeling. So specifically, uh, uh, we're going to start with this model in heart disease version 3 that we created and I'm going to save it to version four in anticipation that we're going to be modifying it here. And this is a good practice. The best practice is to keep successive versions of model. These days we often do so um, with a certain degree of pain, I might add, in any logic using a, a tool like Git. Um, and, uh, but the basic principle is uh, create successive versions of your model and keep track when you produce results. Um, what model version gave rise to them? What parameter assumptions with that model version were involved in producing each result? And make sure you have that traceability so it becomes time to reproduce those results. Or if you want to know, are those results tainted by some problem discovered in the model? Um, it, you have that ability to go back and figure out um, uh, how to reproduce or, or whether these results should still be uh, considered uh, valid, et cetera. Okay, um, so we say version four and we're gonna add a couple things. Um, so the first thing we're going to add has significant um, uh, import to it. And that is, uh, right now, we have no mortality represented for the model. It's a closed population. It's a cohort we follow over time, um, where despite the ravages of heart disease in terms of mortality, there's no heart disease in the model. Uh, excuse me, there's no mortality in the model. We're going to add mortality as an effect and, and turn this from a, from a uh, closed population to an open population. So to do that, um, we're going to have some mortality related, related transitions. And we're gonna, uh, we're gonna uh, we can represent those in several different ways. One of the, for, for this model, one of the main principles though we'll bring to the table is that if there are certain of the states um, in the model that affect mortality, we want, to, to capture that in the mortality process, how we represent the mortality process. And so specifically, we're going to take into account the fact that 
heart disease has a devastating impact on risk of mortality, um, affecting you know one of the the foremost systems uh, that features in uh, in uh, risk of death. So we're going to go to our person. So remember, you have to remember where you are in a model. You can be going to persons. A person is on the canvas. We're we're scrolling over here to see heart disease, and we're going to add a representation of mortality. So we're going to drag in a final state here. Okay. Um, from excuse me, we go in the palette and we scroll down. We go here to the palette and we scroll down and we go down to this agent part of the palette. We've we've done some similar things yesterday. And in the agent part, you'll find a final state. Do you see that? We'll, we'll click on that and drag it into the canvas like that, okay? So again, within this window here, you should see a palette. If you don't see a palette, you may wanna call it up here. Um, you can always toggle what, what windows are shown here. But um, we're going to the agent part, we're clicking on this and we're dragging it in. So here's a final state, but we have to hitch it up to these states. Right now, this represents a possibility, conceptually a possibility of the agent uh, encountering a fatal situation, but we need to hitch it up. So the first transition we're gonna put into place is for individuals who have a healthy heart. So we're gonna take, we're gonna click on transition, drag over, and make sure it turns green there. Again, remember that? Green is the color. State charts of the game. See this? <laughs> There's green there. At least someone got that. I think Wade got that a couple of years ago. But um, okay, uh, there we go. Now, now drag it over to this uh, final state. Make sure it's green on both sides. Okay? There we are. Um, and we're going to drag it down to heart disease and uh, have another transition originating there into the final state. These represent the possibility, a process by which individuals who are in with either a healthy heart or, or with heart disease can, can die, okay? And we're going to associate them with a certain risk per year of passing away. How do we do that? What's What do we need to do to those transitions to have it represent a certain chance per year that someone would die? Anyone say? What do we need to do to those transitions? Turn it to a rate transition. So right now, both are timeout transitions. And instead, we want them to be rate transitions. And this is broadly, you know, a need. Um, there's a... There's a lot of context where rate transitions do the heavy lifting within agent-based models. This is not specific to any logic, although it carries over to it. Um, because with a rate transition, you can capture state-dependent risk of a transition happening right now. Whereas a timeout transition, there are times we'll, we'll use it flexibly to draw from a distribution as to when we'll leave, but it doesn't capture the fact that often our risk of undergoing a transition changes as our state changes. And a good way to capture that is through a rate. In the most simple case here, we'll make it a fixed transition, but it will be a different, a fixed rate transition, a fixed con a constant, but it will be a different constant from healthy heart and heart disease. Um, but in general, we'll often have transitions whose rate is some function of other characteristics and state of that individual. For example, it may depend on their age of that individual. It may depend on some aspects of their other health state. It may depend on characteristics like sex. It may depend on uh, something about how long they've been a smoker or what have you. And in general, we can capture that quite adequately. And if there's interest, 
I could have a session where we illustrate um, that principle and we can draw on literature from things like survival analyses or competing risks analysis for current events analysis using statistical models. Um, we may get there, but first we walk before we run, okay? So for this transition here, we're going to have a certain probability, which uh, certain probability per year, excuse me. Um, so which of these do you think would be a higher chance per year, going from healthy heart and dying from there or from heart disease? Anyone? Which is higher? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. On a per year basis, uh, your chance of dying from heart disease is higher than that from a healthy heart. So uh, we will say um, uh, death from, for this one, we'll name it death from natural causes. Remember names matter. Names enhance transparency of a model. Um, uh, if, if you have a name that's intention revealing, it can help people understand for what, pur what its purpose is within the model. So we're gonna name that one death from, from natural causes. You noticed I, I showed the name with this little uh, checkbox there, and we're gonna do a similar thing here, okay? This is going to be death with heart disease, okay? Um, and we're going to show this name here as well, okay? There we go, okay. Now, we're a lot of the way through with this, but first we need to put in place fixed th these values. Again, in general, this might be X of some beta zero plus beta one times some, some value with this agent plus beta two times uh, some other covariate, et cetera. I'm drawing on, on um, studies of survival analysis, but here it'll be a fixed value reflecting the fact we've already factorized out um, uh, the, the, the heavy dependence on heart disease. So we have one for this, one for that, we stratified it out. So this one will be 0 0.0125 per year from natural causes. And this one will be for the rate 0 0.04. Um, right. Um, okay. Um, so on average 25 years would die, um, from heart disease within this heart disease, from within this heart disease. Okay. Or die um, with heart disease. Okay. So, so, uh, we're almost done. Um, we have this developing, uh, uh, this mortality from healthy art. This applies while they're in this state. These two will compete as transitions. And it may be they develop heart disease faster than the supplies, or it may be that uh, they die first before they develop heart disease. Um, we capture those competing risks. Um, and uh, they're going to have a higher risk of dying from heart disease. But we need one final, we need one final uh, component here. Okay, we need to actually implement uh, the death event. And there's actually two major ways of implementing this. Uh, any any logic. Okay, I'm going to show you one of them, uh, and. In order to show this, um, we're going to have to reason where it occurs. We could have it occur along this transition in the so-called action of the transition. Thus far, all our actions have been when you like enter a state. Do you remember this? We set this color when they entered that state or when they entered this state. But we can, along transitions, put in place action. So when it fires, do this. But here, what we're going to do is go to this state, this final state and associate an action with it. And that factorizes it out. It reflects the fact, no matter whether they're dying from natural causes or heart disease, in this case, we want them 
to do the same thing, which is remove this person from the population. Okay. So we're going to put a bit of code here in the action, just as we did when entering this state or this state, et cetera. We're going to put a bit of code here for this action. What code it is, in order to understand this code, I'm going to need to point you to main. So we're going to go down main. Okay. Um, we're going to go down main and You'll notice that in Maine, there's a population. What's the name of that population in Maine? Can anyone say? I'll give you a hint. It begins with P. Ends with an N. It is the second P. Three letters after, or two letters after the first. The population is named what? Population. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, okay. Uh, so it's named population. This is going to be important for what I write next, okay? So pay attention to what the name of the population is because we're going to have to refer to that when we remove them, okay? It's a little bit of a quirk, but I'm going to teach you two things here. So we have to say, hey, go remove myself from the population, okay? I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to learn you three things here. First is how to remove someone from a population, or how to remove anything from the population. The second will be, how do I refer to myself? And the third thing will be, if I'm an agent in this population, I'm a person in this population, how do I refer to my population in which I'm located, hmm? in which I am ensconced, hmm? in which I am embedded, okay? Okay, so we're gonna write some code and it's gonna it's gonna tell you all three about those things, different aspects of it. So first of all, I am going to refer to the population, but in order to do that, where does the population in this model live? Does it live in person? Does it live in the baseline experiment? Where does it live? Where does the population live? If I want to go look at the population, where would where does it live? Just switch to it earlier. It lives in Maine. Yeah, just like Bangor and, you know, Brunswick. And, okay. Maybe Jared would know. Okay, um, Southport, um, Kitty, Kitty Bunkport. Okay, anyway. Um, uh, you'll notice if you scroll up person, there's a pointer to Maine. Do you see this? It says Maine there. Mm -hmm. Not with an E, I'd my dad. Um, so, so each person knows about Maine because they're in a population within Maine. They, they know about Maine, okay? Um, and, uh, and so here for this death, this final state, um, which I sometimes call the, the death star, um, uh, we have to tell it, hey, Maine, um, your population removed me, okay? And this is how I say that in Java. Hey, your population removed me from removed me from your population. This is what I talk. Okay, I say main dot. It's kind of like saying mains. Imagine the dots like an apostrophe. It's like saying mains thing. Do this, okay? I'm gonna say for main remove under bar population. Now, if population were named pop, it would be remove under bar pop. If population were spelt P-O-P-L-N, it would be remove under bar P-O-P-L-N, okay? So it's, it's actually the name remove under bar, the name of the population. And then I have to say remove me. So I'm saying, hey, me. Undertake this action on your population. Remove me from me. Remove me from your population. How do I say me? I say this, this. Okay. Oh, and you tell me. Do I need a semicolon? Need or not? I do. If this were just a formula, if it were what we call an expression, something calculating, like computing a value, would I need a semicolon? 
No, if I, if I give a rate for a transition, or if I give the number of people in the population, maybe a formula, but I don't need, I don't need a semicolon, it's just giving a value. But if I'm telling it, do something, remember the command, the injunction, remember that? Hmm? The imperative? Hmm? The imperative case in declinations or, or uh, conjugations of a verb, yeah? Do this? Hmm? Um, I think it's vocative in Latin or something, if, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but in any case, um, you say semicolon. It's a command. You're saying, do it. Make this happen. Change the state in this way. Change the situation in the model. So remove. So let's read it out. Hey, Maine, remove me from, remove me from your population. Okay. But this is all one thing. There could be multiple populations. So it could be pop one, pop two, pop three, and each would have a remove under bar pop one, remove under bar pop two. Group under bar pop three. And guess what? Remove is not, it's not alone. There's a gain and a gun. There's add but under bar population will be coming to two for open populations. There's remove me from population, then there's add this baby to the population or add this immigrant. Okay, are we okay with that? Are we okay or not? Here are no directions. Um, okay. Now, do you remember, how do I ask any logic? Do you understand this model? Do, do, are you, do, you, do you understand it? Are you confused about it? Um, how do I do that? What, what do I press as a button to do that? The build model. And where is build model located? That's yeah, this right here with these ones and zeros. And if I press it, you'll see down in the lower left of the model, it says builds completed successfully. Mm -hmm. Now, if it if I did something wacko, like, okay, this isn't wacko, but imagine I had a typo, right? I didn't say this, I said, um, and I press this, it's gonna say, look, I don't know. And it's gonna show things in the problem window. Do you see that? Mm. You see this, this problem window? Now, if you double click on one of these, it will actually bring you, by and large, it'll bring you to where, what is confusing it. And you can work to resolve it. And you say, oh, oh, I forgot it this. Or if, you know, I misspelled this, right? If I, if I spelt this with, with uh, like that, it would say like, I don't know where, I don't know where remove pop is. And and I would go back and I would I would fix it. So this problem window is 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 designed to alert you to cases where any logic just doesn't understand what you're trying to say, and it will it will try to point you to where it's confused. And by double clicking on it, um, you can get to it and 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 resolve it in most cases. Are we okay with that? And generally speaking, if it's confused about a lot of things. Focus on the first one or two. Don't don't get caught up in all the things because sometimes the first one or two will fix the others too. Like if you, especially if you like, well, okay, I won't go into it. Think it from an old man. There are times where errors cascade. And like, if you forget to close a comment or you forget a semicolon or you put, you know, a colon instead of a, don't don't do these things at home. Okay. Um, okay. Anyway, I I built this. It's happy. This means it's a happy camper. And now remember, run early, run often. When you build a model, ladies and gentlemen, you want to build it incrementally. Build it incrementally has enjoys many virtues to recommend. I'll I'll just rattle off a few. But uh, I may take this on as a subject later if it's uh, of greater interest. You more quickly find errors. You, you make fewer changes between times you try to run it. So any errors that come up, you're clear what change is modified. Because you just change one or two things. And now you're getting this weird error message in the problems window. You can track it down to just a couple things you did. 
if you run the model and you find some bizarre behavior, you can also track that down to what you've just done. But it's in the nature of simulation models that they often surprise us. We're dealing with complex systems and complex systems exhibit emergence. Complex systems defy seat of the pants reasoning about exactly how it's going to behave. And they often surprise us. They often give rise to behavior we don't anticipate that can't be anticipated from the pieces. Gives rise to higher level behavior that we might not anticipate. Often we don't anticipate its details. And one of the big insights we seek to gain with dynamic modeling is for many modeling projects, why do we see this behavior? And if you're running it, having just changed a number of things, a couple things, you more quickly zero in on what contributed to that behavior. Why do we suddenly see this behavior? If you build the whole model and only then run it, God help you. I mean, there's all these things going on. You got to go and figure out what contributed. You end up you end up engineering in ways of disabling this, disabling that, turn that off, re-enabling it, and, and it takes a long time to track down. If you're running it along the way, you're, you become much more savvy, and you may make different decisions about what to do next by that learning along the way. It empowers learning along modeling path. Hmm? by building it along the way, observing behavior. Sometimes what you'll see, you'll say, is that a bug? That's really weird behavior. And then you realize, oh, that, that's actually pretty interesting. <laughs> I didn't think that would result. Maybe, maybe we don't have to add that. Feature. Maybe we've got a paper just you know, from this, from what we're seeing with these just these three things that explains this behavior that we're anticipating, or that, that we'd like to explain. We don't have to add X, Y, Z, A, B, C. We just uh, could explain it with this simple set of factors. You learn from the model more clearly as you're modifying fewer things. You also keep the model in a runnable state. One of uh, uh, my closest colleagues, esteemed modeler and, and guide in the system sciences, Jeff McDonald, um, an MD and engineer uh, by training, who's, who's for decades led modeling projects, um, likes to say, never have a simulation model more than 30 minutes from being able to run. <laughs> because you may be called upon to run, run it, to learn from it, to show somebody it, to get feedback from someone. Um, try to keep it, try to keep close to the ground. Try to keep it firm and learn from it along the way and make decisions. That's how to be nimble with modeling, okay? And it's how to stay sane with modeling. How to, how to more quickly find your way out of issues. So if problems come up, it's, it'll be fewer of them. If you go and you only run it after a month of work, you'll get what's called the big bang effect <laughs> where it's like all these errors and you don't know, you know, um, and you're not sure what's causing them. So always keep a model 30 minutes from being run. Right, Wade? Yes. Um, <laughs> take it from a long time veteran. Okay. Okay. So we've added this. May we run it? Okay. Um, okay. We're going to write, do you remember how to run? Tell me two ways to have it run. Mm -hmm. Tell me two ways. I want to build flexibility here. Tell me two ways. Okay, right click on the scenario and, and click want run. What's another way I can have it run? This one. Yes, I can run it through here and run it well like the wind. Um, uh, and there's actually a third way, right? Um, model run. You can choose that. Pick your poison. Or you can hit F5. Run, or you can hit F mobile. Um, you can hit F5. Okay. Okay. So do we see any effect of mortality? Yes. Okay. How do we how do we know mortality is active? No. Indeed. People are people are disappearing over time. 
the population is being reduced, okay? So we've transformed this from a closed population to an open population. Now we, we could have it readily depend on age beyond. So controlling for heart disease have it also depend on age. Um, so we have effects of both. Um, uh, but for now, I, I have some simpler tasks, but are people comfortable with what you've done, what we've done here? Any questions on it? Can I post this model? Would that be useful? This version of the model? And I will now create version five of the model. Again, it's, it's good to have a log book of what was version four, what was version five, what was version six. And to, and to be clear, when you've run each to contribute to results. Okay, so I'm going to go do that. And I will now engage with the, uh, with the uh, vagaries of Windows tyranny. But fortunately we added a shortcut with Larissa's help and happiness is upon us. It's now posted, okay, version five, oh, version five, okay, okay. Okay, um, I should have been careful though because really I should have posted before renaming it version five. Anyway, okay, happy happy. Um, maybe I'll I'll skip to version six. These are just designators, and we'll start modifying this. Okay, next, what I want to do is I want to have an intervention here. I want I want to actually I'm, I want to examine the effects of of adding what if scenarios and see what their are. Can we do this? Mm -hmm. um, the problem is that right now we have rather anecdotal understanding of model dynamics. I'd, I'd like to get to what if comparisons, but in order to do that, I need to enable meaningful comparisons. And right now, the kind of impressions I get from running the model are very qualitative. They're very, they're very, you know, visual, and they lend themselves to a lot of, you know, un uncertainty about okay, how many people have heart disease, how many people are dying, etc. We need to do something. We need to have in place some metrics, some outcomes for this model that are more quantitative than this to be able to compare things. Can we do that? So we're gonna do that on our way to, to getting in place interventions with your lead. Okay, so let's put into place some basic mechanisms for some, um, for some outcomes, okay? Uh, so um, we are going to use an extremely useful construct in any body to put in place something that's a general need for Asian based model. To wit, the need to have observer processes. When we build Asian based models, there's quite a bit of logic that governs model evolution, that shapes model evolution, that causally drives model evolution. So when I say governs it, I mean it, it causally influences the evolution of the model. There's a lot of logic in these models for that. If we look at those state charts, they're emblematic of that. If we look at that mortality process, that's an example of things that govern the evolution of model of the state. The situation of the model is inf over time is influenced by those factors. Do you agree? All those things influence the situation over time. But a lot of the logic in real world models has another component. One of the biggest ones is the need to report. To, to report outcomes from the model. This is what I'd like to call, with a nod to uh, philosophy, is, is epiphenomenon. It doesn't govern the model's evolution. It's rather reporting on the state of the model at any one time. Mm -hmm. And it can be captured very well, category two by ones, but that's not the focus here. Okay. <laughs> um, so ladies and gentlemen, um, we need to add some reporting 
processes, or what are called by Railsbeck and Grimm's book, an individual and agent-based modeling observer processes. And it's a good term for it. These are processes. They're things that happen over time, but their job is not to shape the model evolution, it's to report on it. Hmm? Hmm? So we need to add these to the model. Um, how will we do that? Let us count the ways, okay? Um, so um, uh, here, we're going to go to the population and I'm going to introduce to you one of the most common ways and then we're gonna break for lunch, okay? Go into Maine, go down Maine and we're going to go to the population in Maine. Okay. Maine, we're going to select population. And we're going to go to an area called statistics. Do you see that? See or not? See. Thank you. Um, okay. So there's a, if you go to Maine, double click on Maine and bring it up. And we're going to go click on the population and it will come up in our, it'll come up in our properties window and you're going to scroll down and, and you're going to open up, what do they call this? An accordion menu, menu? I think. Um, and right now, no items are defined. So we're going to add one. May I? So you'll notice that we equip to compute statistics over the population. Okay. And we're going to compute some statistics. I'm going to teach you some simple principles for computing uh, an important class. Okay. So we're going to compute a statistic never smokers with heart disease. And this is going to be a count, okay? But if I want to be a bit clear, I could say count number smokers with heart disease, but I, I'm, I, I think it's a, a decent balance between brevity and clarity. Okay. My students don't always think my names have that balance. Okay, so this is a count. We're going to count the number of people with a certain characteristic, okay? Maybe for teaching this with an eye on the time, I'm going to actually, instead of saying never smokers with heart disease, I'm going to instead say, we're, we're going to build up to that, but I'm going to say never smokers, okay? Or it's going to be a count of never smokers. Are we okay with that? Okay, walk before you run, right? Okay, now it's going to go through each person in the population. It's going to call them something. And it's going to evaluate this condition, this criteria. Are they counted or not? Okay, that's what this condition says. And if you look, there's a little light bulb here, which is going to give you a hint what it calls each person. It's going to give us each person with a certain name. And we're going to say, is that person qualified to be counted in this count? Yes or no? That's the condition. We're going to give it a logical condition. Are they qualified or not? What's it going to call each person? It's going to call them agent. That was a change in 8.9 from item. <laughs> well, I'll be. <laughs> Boy, am I glad I checked it there. It used to be called item. I'd rather prefer agent, but does that mean old models get automatically ported with that? Uh, anyway, uh, Wade and I, um, we have some discussion to have. Okay, we're going to ask, is the agent a never smoker? How would we know? You tell me, how would we know? If, if you looked at this, how would we know whether or not they're a never smoker? If, if, if I had a person, double click on this so I can look at this, how would I know whether or not they're a never smoker? Would I look at their fill color or, or look at their heart disease hazard? How would I know if they're a never smoker? What would I do? Most obvious thing. I would say variable quality. You could, do, you could do that, 
But even more basic, using just looking at this, where would you ask? Corner. Sorry? Sorry? Boundary color. Well, you could try to figure it out through boundary color. It's good, but th there's something more basic. Just ask if the agent is in the never state. Ask if the agent is in this state right now. Are we in agreement that that would be good if we could ask that? And ask that we can. May we do so? Okay. So we shall. We shall. Okay. So back to Maine. And we're going down to our statistic and we're going to fill in agent dot in state. Okay, wait. Um help help me wait. Autocomplete not working. Autocomplete not working. The same thing that I just it it, the autocomplete doesn't work, right? Yeah, the autocomplete doesn't work. Yeah, yeah, but it's not that in state doesn't exist. It's it's just it just doesn't work as an autocomplete. Okay, and we have to ask: Are they in the the never smoker state? But there's a twist, and the minutes count down, so I have to cut to the chase. Maybe we have in this model. Um, Sometimes models can have multiple types of agents. You might have a physician agent, a patient agent. Each of them might have a smoking status, as odd as that sounds. But, um, and so we have to tell who's smoking status. So we have to say actually person, because it's in person dot never smoker. And now it auto completes happily. Okay. Okay. So, you notice, by the way, I surreptitiously pressed built just to make sure we're all in straight and narrow. Um, so if, if we didn't fill in person dot, it would be confused. It would say, who, who's, like, what's never smoker? It's never smoker was related, you know, as given by person. It's not smart enough to say there's only one agent class with only one type of agent, which is a never smoker here. It's not smart enough. Um, so we have to say, and never smoker defined in person. I know it's annoying. We'll do better someday soon. Okay. Are we okay with that? So we're going through each person in the population, one by one, calling the matron and saying, hey, is this agent in this state? So it's never smoker state as defined by person. Are we okay with that? Now, do we need a semicolon or not? No, this is a logical question. Are they in the state or not? It's computing true or false. We don't need a semicolon. Semicolon is when we tell them, do this thing. Do that. Get over there. Quiet down. It's the ball players. <laughs> Quiet down. Um, <laughs> and then they tackle me. Um, okay. Okay, so can we run this? Can, cannot. Can. Okay, I'm going to right click and I'm going to say run. We good? Okay, now you may not notice any difference, but if you click on person on population here, you'll see it actually counting never smokers 45, 44, 42, 41. Do you see that? How does it know how to compute that? Hmm? We just told it how to do so. So let's 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 complete the thought. So we're going to add two more: never smokers, current smokers, and former smokers. And you're going to tell me what to put: current smokers and former smokers. And what is the bit of code that I put in here for current smokers? You tell me. What does it say? You tell me what to in put. State person dot current. Agent dot in state person dot current smoker. And I could copy and paste, and I'd be a happy camper. But uh, but uh, I can illustrate this. Yeah, I prefer to copy and paste it and, and fix it. But person dot former smoker. 
where are those names coming from? In case you missed it uh, earlier, I just remind you that those names are coming from these names here. If we changed former smoker to past smoker, we would have to change that to be past smoker for, for the count of former smokers, okay? So those are three statistics. It's going over the population and counting them. You might imagine it going over the population, summing up the income or averaging the income or taking the max income, et cetera. You can imagine where this is going, but let's do one final run and, and we'll get you off to lunch and dodging the, the football stampede. Okay, here we go. And okay. And I'm going to click on population. There we go. 20, 23 current smokers, 44, 42, 40, never smokers, former smokers changing. Why are former smokers and current smokers seeming to change so much faster than current never smokers? Do you notice it, it changes a lot faster? Why is that? The rate was so small. Uh, well, yeah, for, for quitting and cessation, it's quite a high hazard rate. So they're going back and forth between those states quite closely. And if you were to look at people in the population, you would actually see this, okay? You would actually see them going back and forth, current smoker, former smoker, see them going back like that, back and forth. Do you see that? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that's all we have time for right now. We need to get you off to lunch and hopefully you will... Um, um, you will have more pleasant surrounds today than yesterday. Um, and we will resume in one hour's time. Okay. Thank you very much.